If you would please this morning, would you open up your Bibles to the book of um, Psalms is where we're going to be. Psalms, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of like in the middle of the Bible. So if you kind of like take it and open up in the middle, you'll probably come to Psalms or Proverbs. Psalms is actually before Proverbs, and so if you've gone to Proverbs, you need to back up a little bit. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 27. Psalm chapter 27 is where we're going to be today. We are in a sermon series called Always True. Well, what's always true? God's promises are always true. When God says something, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's going to be, it's, it's going to be true. And, and when God says some things, that's when our ears need to kind of perk up and take notice, okay? And maybe some of us this morning are kind of in the thick of it. And life is hard, and it's difficult, and it's tricky. And you're wondering if things are ever going to improve or get better. Well, here's what you need to do in this situation. You need to get your feet on the rock of the Word of God. And and I'm telling you, God's promises are sure, and they're steadfast, and they will be there for you as a shelter in the time of the storm that you may be experiencing. There are some main things that God asserts, um, some different types of categories of promises. And remember when we first started this whole sermon series off, we kind of said like God's promises are kind of like diamonds in a mountain. And the mountain of gold, God's promises have been sprinkled all throughout the mountain of gold, which is God's word. And our job, what we're trying to do with these promises, is we're going throughout God's word to try to gather the diamonds in the rough, so to speak. Okay? And and so let me just share with you some of the the diamonds that we've we've captured so far. Uh, We started off with this promise. The promise that simply says, I will always be with you. No matter what, when the going gets tough, I'm going to be there with you. You have that assurance. You have that promise that God has given to us. And Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, those two verses pretty clearly state that God is with us. And whom shall I fear? What can man possibly do to me? Because God will never abandon or forsake us, especially in our times of need. The second promise that we looked at was the promise that simply said, I am, that God is always in control. We looked at these two verses last week, the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. A lot of you have these verses memorized, and there's a reason you've got these verses memorized. Because they are precious, because they're valuable. Well, today the promise that we're going to look at today is, I will not despair. God is always good. And I know that this promise is a really difficult one sometimes for us to understand. Because when I'm in pain, or when something difficult happens to my loved ones, how can I possibly assert the fact that God is good? Where is his goodness in times like that? Listen, God wants you to come to a place in your life where you have to lean on his promises. Where you have to put your full weight down upon them and prove them to be true. To prove them to to be true, to hold you up. To keep you standing in those moments when you needed them the most. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8, it's a good reminder. It says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. People come and go, things come and go. But the promises of God are everlasting. And here's the neat thing. My life, your life, is proof of the promises of God. When people are looking at us and we're experiencing difficulties in life, they're looking and and our life is demonstrating, it's proclaiming, it's shouting that, wow, God is always with me. Wow, I have nothing to fear because God is with me. My life is proof that that God is always in control, no matter what happens. And my life is proof that God is always good. Let me illustrate the promises in a way that maybe you're going to understand. I need Brian Bliss to come forward this morning, please. You're in the sermon now, Brian. Come on down. So, um, you may have noticed we've got these, uh, these two chairs here, and, and uh, Brian was joking. He's like, maybe we ought to just, you know, replace our pews and put these in, so, you know, it'd be all right. These are actually, um, the, these, these come from my man cave at home, and these are surprisingly very, very comfortable. These are um, van seats, is what they are. Brian, come over here and have a stand back here just for a moment. Okay, so let me illustrate the promises of God this way, if I can, okay? Okay, let's pretend this is a car. Let's pretend you're 
car, this car that we have here represents your life. Okay? Great. So you're in, in your life and, and you're driving down the road. The first promise that we have is this. I will not fear. God is with me. Come over here and have a seat, Brian. Sure. Boy, what? What comfort that brings to know that I've got God with me in my life. No matter where I go, that's a good feeling, right? But the promises extend beyond just having God with you. The promises extend to say, you know what? God's in control. Come over here, Brian. I'm going to give you the steering wheel. All right. <laughs> so now in my life, not only is God with me, but now God's in control. And you know what? That actually works out real well. But here's the problem that a lot of us have. We're, we're like, you know, grabbing onto that little handle over here, and we're like fastening our seatbelt because we're not sure where this whole thing is going to end up, right? Well, that's what we're coming to today is, I'm not going to despair. God is always good. He's not going to take this car in a direction that's not for my benefit. He's going to take this car in a direction that is pleasing, that is perfect, that is wonderful. And what a peace of mind that gives to me. Amen? Now, Brian, I know you want to sit here for the rest of the sermon. I'm going to say no. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. You've helped me illustrate that perfectly. But this, is, this kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about the promises of God, okay? That God is with me. Yeah, that's great. But even better than just having God with me, God's in control. But better than having just God in control like a maniac behind the wheel, he's always good. And these are the promises that we have to assert, that we have to prove, okay? Because now as we're getting into the fact that God is always good, now we're getting to this, um, a little bit of a description of God's heart in the matter. And uh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. All right, so now we come to our text this morning. Psalm chapter 27. Are you there? Verse 13. This is the diamond in the mountain of gold that we are going to extract, that we are going to hold on to, that we're going to explore today. Listen to what David says. Psalm chapter 27, verse 13. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So here's the promise that God gives. And, and what we're going to do this morning is we're going to walk through this verse phrase by phrase. Okay? And so the first phrase that I, I want us to explore is the phrase that David says, I would have despaired. You see, as, as you read through Psalm chapter 27, you realize, boy, David's got a lot of bad stuff kind of looming in his life. He's talking about all of his enemies who want to dis destroy him, who want to dethrone him as king. He's talking about all these things that threaten to take of the security that he's got for himself, okay? And, and maybe you come this morning and you've got some things that you could despair about. We all know life is not easy. It is difficult. And I love David's honesty. Because he's like, I would have despaired. Listen, despair is a place that we don't want anyone to go. Okay? You don't even want people that you don't like to go to despair. Because despair always leads to dark, lonely, hopeless places. It's a horrible place to be. Uh, in fact, Webster's Dictionary defines despair in this way, and I think the, the definition is spot on. It's great. <clears throat> Destitute of any positive expectation. That's, de that's despair. You're destitute of any positive expectation. So if you're in despair, hey, what are you excited about? Nothing. What are you looking forward to? Nothing. What's the best thing in your future that you can see? Nothing. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. No idea of how possibly this situation is going to get any better. There's no hope. You have no words to pray. Despair is the devil pleading and persuading you to come down this path. That's exactly what despair is. And David heard it. He heard Satan's whispers of, hey, you've got, you've got no hope in this situation. Everybody's looking to, to come and attack your kingdom that you've established. And he felt the vortex of despair calling out to him. And I love David's honesty. You see, that's reassuring to me because when I open God's word, I don't find it to be phony or fake or to be some superficial, oh, it'll be okay. We're dealing with real people who have dealt with situations that you, you find yourself in today as well. And so David's honesty is, I would have despaired. This man after God own, God's own heart, uh, anointed by Samuel, a slayer of giants, 
He was no stranger to suffering. Even King David said, I could have despaired. I, I would have despaired. He felt the looming cloud of despair that was looking to, to kind of dim the hope that God would have for him. And this is what you must understand. Because I think we get this misconception here today. That Satan doesn't want you anything to, in your life to prosper. He doesn't want anything good to happen to you in your life. He doesn't. He hates you. He wants to steal, to kill, and destroy you. That's what he wants to do. And so if he can get you to a place of despair, to a place of hopelessness, that's what he wants to do. Because then you've given up. If you're in a place of despair, you've given up. Now, James McDonald in his book says that there are three things that amplify despair. And I want to go through those three things very quickly for you this morning. The first thing that amplifies despair, if you're in a situation that's bad, and it's going to go from bad to despair, these three things will amplify it. Here's the first, surprise. It's a big factor in despair. Everything was going great. I was walking along in life, and then bam, I got leveled. I got flattened. I did not see that coming. And now I'm flat on my back and the wind is knocked out of my sail. And I'm having a hard time getting up. Surprise is a big factor. In football, the most dangerous hit you can receive is one that you do not see coming. And so too in life, those big hits that can cause despair are the ones that take you by surprise. Surprise is the first thing that increases despair. Here's the second. Things that are severe. The big things in life. I mean, you don't despair over a parking ticket. You don't despair over a car repair. You despair over the major things in life. The things that have just, wow, turned the wheelbarrow upside down and now everything's scattered everywhere. Like disease. Insurmountable debt. Infidelity. Those are the things that are major. And all those things can lead to despair if you're not careful. Here's the third thing that amplifies in despair. It's the feeling that things are settled. Or at least the enemy has you convinced that it's settled. It's final. It's over. It's done. There's nothing you can do. You can't fix it. You can't change it. It's just the way it is. It's settled. And things that are settled in your life that you don't like the outcome of how they've been settled, those things always lead to regret. And God doesn't want you to live your life in regret. He doesn't want you to live, look back and think, oh, I wish I could have done that, or oh, I wish I would have done that differently. That's not what God wants for you in your life. That's what Satan wants. And uh, you need to hear this morning that things are not settled. That's not the final, uh, the final end of the story for you. And so we've looked a little bit about despair, but now we have to figure out how we're going to handle it. Okay, we've defined it. We understand that some of us have it. How do we handle it? How do we get out of despair? Well, check out the next phrase. David says, I would have despaired unless I had believed. See, we're just going line by line through this verse. Unless I had believed. Uh, unless I had grabbed hold of God's promises... When the difficult thing happened to me in my life, the solution seemed like a long ways off. And I would have despaired, but I've got God's promises here with me. I've got his promises to believe in, to hope in. And some of you are fighting a battle that is simply too big for you. And truth be told, you don't have the resources on your own to get out of it. To get what needs to be done. And in that situation, there is room for despair to grab hold of you and to drag you down. I want to encourage you with Exodus chapter 14. You know this story well. I could even tell you how many times I've recounted this story, this event in history. But the reason I, I refer to it so often is, man, there's a lot of wisdom to glean from this. In Exodus chapter 14, you remember that, don't you? The Israelites were being held captive in Egypt. God didn't like it, and so he commissions Moses to go lead his people into the land of freedom. The only problem is, Pharaoh didn't like the fact that the Israelites were leaving. And so he chases after them. 
And so the Israelites are now trapped. In front of them lies the Red Sea. It's too wide to go around. It's too deep to try to cross. They had horses and carriages and small children and elderly people. So what were they going to do? Because behind them, the enemy's closing in fast. Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 10. <coughs> As Pharaoh drew, drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. And now some of us can totally relate to verse 10. We have the enemy chasing us. And it would appear that he has us cornered. That we have no solution, no answer, no remedy. And so the natural result of that would be fear. Because you don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know how painful things are going to get. Listen, God's made some promises. And the message that I have for you is the same message that Moses gave, the, gave to the Israelites in verse 13. Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you this day. The Lord will fight for you. Okay, so, so what am I supposed to do? What's, what's my role in this, God? Here it is. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. You only have to be silent. Can you handle that? Your job is to keep quiet. Don't make it worse with what you say. Don't inflame the situation with stupid words. Just keep quiet and hold on to the promises of God. Stand still and let God work. Man, I don't know about you, but I needed that this week. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, another favorite by so many. Uh, the New American Standard translation translates this. Cease striving and know that I am God. The NIV says, be still and know that I am God. At the bottom of the New American Standard translation on this verse, cease striving, um, they have a footnote. And it's interesting if you read the footnote. The Bible actually says that this word can also be translated, relax. I like that word. Some of us need to relax in our situations. We need to relax and know that God is exactly who he said he is. He's powerful, he's in control, he's always with me. Hear me on this. When we find ourselves in situations that are beyond our control and we think it's the end of the world and we just hate it because it makes us uncomfortable, God loves it. God loves it when we're in those situations. He doesn't like it that we're feeling uncomfortable, but he loves it when we're at the end of our rope. You know why? Because then we have nothing to do but turn to him. And he loves it. He wants to show up big in those situations. So what's my part? Well, well, I'm believing. I would have despaired unless I had believed. Well, believing what exactly? Well, unless I had believed that I would see. Boy, those are three words that I think some people can use here this morning. How many people here today need to see something from God? You need God to work. It's beyond your control. It's beyond your measure. You need God to show up big in your life to handle the situation because you can't do it on your own. And look, you're going to see. Well, what am I going to see? You're going to see the goodness of the Lord. I'm not going to hear about it. I'm not just going to get a faint whiff of it. I'm going to see it and I'm going to experience the goodness of the Lord in my life. And that's the next part of this. Well, when's it going to happen, Mark? I've been waiting for a long time. Be patient. Because what else? when will it happen? It'll happen in the land of the living. It'll happen in my lifetime. This isn't a promise that's futuristic that, oh, well, one day when you get to heaven, you get to experience this. This is a promise for the here and the now. In the land of the living, I will see the goodness of the earth. While I'm living on this earth, while I'm breathing in and out, while I'm terra firma here in this planet, in this life, I'm going to see God's goodness. And here's the question I have. How many people have the faith to believe it? As I'm preaching here this morning, maybe you're thinking, Psh, that's not going to happen. I've been dealing with this for a long time, Mark. You just don't know. You don't know my situation. This is a promise from God. That we will see it. We have to believe it. Otherwise, despair. And I would have despaired if not for the goodness of the Lord. 
I believe I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in my lifetime. Well, here's what I want to do with the rest of the message here this morning is I want to talk a little bit about what is the goodness of the Lord. We've talked about it a lot today. Let's not confuse it. What is the goodness of the Lord? I want to give you some facts about God's goodness. And here's the first fact I want to give you, and that is this. God is always good. He's always good. His disposition is kindness. His default action is for your benefit. Everything that God does is for our good. He loves you, and his love is demonstrated in his goodness. God never has a bad day. God never punishes you because he hates you or he's frustrated with you or or just had it. His discipline always is for your good. In everything, in every season, in every circumstance, God is always good. Every one of God's yeses is a gift. Every one of God's no's is a mercy. He's good. I graduated from Alma High School in 1994. I graduated from Central Christian College of the Bible in 1998. But you know what college I'm enrolled in right now? And it's the same college you're enrolled in. And I'm not planning on graduating anytime soon. It's the College of Suffering. It's the school of suffering and difficulty. And we all face it. But here's what you need to understand is that my suffering does not contradict God's goodness. Just because I'm going through some rough stuff doesn't dictate who God is. He's unchanging. And so if God has been good in the past, then he continues to be good even in the present. My situation, my story does not change who God is. And here's some good news. Here's the second fact about God's goodness. God's goodness is something that he wants us all to experience. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. Taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. Taste and see for yourself. Don't take your friend's word for it. Don't take your preacher's word for it. Taste and see for yourself that God is good. You guys remember that commercial back in, the, I think it was the 80s, maybe uh, early 90s, for Life Cereal? You remember this? Uh, these kids were given, mom went and bought new cereal, and it was the Life, you know, the brand of Life Cereal. And they were kind of unsure about it, because it didn't have, you know, frosting on it. It wasn't animal-shaped. There was no marshmallows in it. And so they were kind of unsure about it. So what did those boys do? Do you remember this? They gave it to who? Mikey! We'll give it to Mikey. And, and what, what about Mikey. Hey, Mikey liked it. You know what? Maybe I'll have a bowl. Mikey liked it. He tried it. It was good. Listen, God doesn't want you to experience whether or not Mikey thinks he's good. He wants you to experience that he's good. He wants you to come to the conclusion in your lifetime that, wow, God is good. He's so faithful. He's so right. He wants you to try him in this. Here's the third fact about God's goodness. God's goodness is the eventual conclusion of every generation of God's children. Every single one of God's children, every single follower of Jesus Christ will come to the inevitable conclusion in your life that God is good. That's the conclusion you will come to. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of your suffering, maybe in the middle of that, you may not think so, but on the other side of it, when you've come to the end of your life and you're reflecting about, wow, this has happened to me in this life and this has happened to me in life, as you reflect on the things that have come to you in your life, the conclusion that you will come to is that God is good. Psalm chapter 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Every generation learns this truth that the Lord is good. But here's the problem that we have, and it's the fifth, or excuse me, the fourth fact about God's goodness. God's goodness is not always immediately apparent. It's not immediately obvious that God is good. That's what Lamentations chapter 3 verse 25 says. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. You see, it's found in the person who waits. And waiting on the Lord is never fun. But while you're waiting on the Lord, trust in the promise that he's good. He's not doing this because he's an evil God or a God who hates me or doesn't love me. He's doing this and it's for my good. I'll wait on him to show me that he's good. 
But if you're coming to God and you're like, okay, God, you've got 10 days, 10 days to show me your goodness or else I'm out of here. I'm going to walk out on this faith thing. Well, that's not going to work out well for you. Because, you see, God doesn't operate on our timetables. And he doesn't respond real well to threats. And so if that's where you've been in this life, you need to get on God's program and be like, okay, God, whenever you say, we'll go through this thing for as long as you say to go through it. But I'm going to trust that at the end of it, I'm going to say, man, God's good. Here's the last promise or fact of, of God's goodness. God's goodness is a refuge, and he's aware of those who find it. You see, God's goodness is a shelter. It's a shield that you hide in. It's a shelter that you can rest upon. And God knows who's trusting in him and who isn't. Number, uh, Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Believe me, God's looking down upon our congregation right now, and he sees it. He knows who's trusting in him, and he's like, yep, he's trusting in me. Nope, she's not. Uh, yep, she did Thursday. Oh, she's starting to. God sees that, and he knows who's trusting in him. I want to conclude this morning with a single verse of Scripture and then a story. And the single verse of Scripture that I'm going to share with you is, and again, it's a familiar treasured truth. You probably have this one memorized. If you don't have it memorized, you at least have heard it. But I want to encourage you with this, and then I'm going to tell you a story to conclude and wrap things up. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. I don't know when the last time you were here was at this verse, but turn there, circle it, underline it, highlight it, whatever you need to do. Get it in your heart and in your mind. Jeremiah has said, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. That's a promise of God. That's a treasured truth of God. That God's goodness, he's totally in control of the situation. And he's going to work it out for good. It's not for your, for your utter destruction and demise. That's not how God operates. He's, he's on your side. Uh, when Lindsay and I, when we were serving at Oak Christian Church, um, we were there uh, 13 years ago, and, and we served there at that church for three years. But during those three years, uh, came across a, a gentleman in the church. He was one of my deep, uh, dear friends. Uh, his name is Jeff Boland. Um, Jeff Boland, um, he was a single dad, um, raising his daughter, Becca. Becca was nine years old at the time when we were there. Jeff was a, a coach uh, for a girls' basketball team in Pattonsburg. Missouri, and uh, just a really, really great guy. I mean, encouraging and willing to do whatever was needed in the church. And um, anyway, I, over the years, I've been close with him through Facebook or email, and we kept in contact. And a few months ago, I, I realized that Jeff was diagnosed with an aggressive and rare form of cancer. And his 21-year-old daughter wrote this entry on Jeff's caring... This is the last entry that she wrote on Jeff's Caring Bridge journal. And she writes, As many of you know, my dad passed away early this morning at 12.54. At 9.45, dad started moving around a lot, and I could tell that he was in some pain. So I told the doctors, and thankfully they were able to give him some medication that eventually stopped the pain. The nurses were honest with me and they told me that, he knew, that they knew that he would not make it much longer. His liver was simply shutting down. It took a few hours, but dad finally stopped breathing. No pain, just one last breath and he was gone. I met with the funeral director today and made the funeral plans. The visitation will be from 6 to 8 on Friday at Pattonsburg High School. The funeral will be Saturday morning at 11 at the school as well. Dad asked that no one bring flowers or plants to the funeral. He would rather people use that money as donations that will benefit the Pattonsburg Athletic Fund. I would also prefer this as well. Dad had mentioned to me some personal touches to the funeral that he would like. One was to have the refs and the umpires wear their uniform shirts if they wanted to. Another was to have some of his former players wear their uniforms. I understand if you'd like to dress up more formal, but as we all know, Dad spent most of his life in sweatpants, so he wouldn't want anything different at his funeral. I want to thank everyone for the encouraging words throughout the day. I never thought that on the worst day of my life I would be able to find joy and share memories of my dad. Dad always said that we need to find joy and we need to encourage one another. 
I found that talking with him helps a lot. So please never feel like you need to avoid the topic with me. I want to talk about dad as much as possible. He will always, uh, he has always been there my entire life and I don't want that to change. I know he may not be here physically on this earth anymore, but his legacy will live on forever. Whether that is through me, his former students, or anyone who ever met my dad. I want him to be remembered and his story told to anyone who will listen. I may I never understand why all this had to happen. And then she writes, But I do know that God's goodness remains, and his name has and will continue to be glorified. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Even though my pain and hurt uh, even though the pain and hurt I am feeling now, I know that God is going to use God, uh, Dad's story to glorify his name. Losing my dad was my, the worst fear I had always had, but I know God's plans for me are so much better for me and my dad could ever dream up. All I try to remember is that my dad got to see Jesus today. Please continue to pray for me and my family. Love, Becca Boland. You see, Becca was a person who understands that God is always good. That it doesn't depend upon what happens to me in this life, good or bad. That doesn't change who God forever is. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You, this morning, probably need to be reminded of the fact that uh, God is good. And I hope you understand that. I hope that you realize that. I hope you lean upon that. I hope you experience that. I hope that you get to taste and see with your own mouth, with your own life, that God is good. And he has your good in mind. Let's stand together. We're going to have our time decision here today. And we're going to sing a, uh, an old song I remember growing up singing. And we're going to sing all four verses of God is so good. What a great reminder here this morning. If you have a decision that needs to be made, if you need to make a decision for the Lord, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is a great time to at least talk about that. Uh, we're going to sing this together. And whatever decision you may have, uh, please come forward and our elders will receive those decisions. Let's sing.